Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. As Ray said, my name is Brian Kitts, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal for Volume 39. Before we get started, there's a, a few things I'd like to mention and a few people I'd like to acknowledge. I'd like to welcome everyone to what is now the third installment in this article presenta presentation series co-hosted by the Journal and by the ABA TIPS Admiralty and Maritime Law Committee. I'd like to acknowledge Ray Wade and Lisko and Lewis. Ray has been instrumental in our both founding this presentation series and its growth and continued success. Ray, thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Martin Davis, your guidance and advice for the journal has been a continued source of our success and our growth as a journal, and for that, we thank you. Finally, Dean Meyer, who isn't here yet but may be attending later, um, support from Dean Meyer and the Tulane leadership um, is a constant source of support for the journal and has allowed the journal to really flourish at the university and for that we are very thankful and very grateful as well. <laughs> Finally, uh, the reason some of you are here, uh, CLE credit. Uh, the Tulane CLE office has affirmed that we can, uh, you can earn up to 1.3 hours of CLE credit for your attendance. The CLE forms are outside in the lobby. If you would like to earn CLE credit, please be sure to fill out that form and I'll have it turned into the CLE office. I wouldn't like to take any more time. I think we're ready to get started. I'll introduce the first speaker, Albert Farr. Hello, good evening. My name is Albert Farr, and I am a third year law student at Tulane Law. I also graduated with my undergraduate in finance and master's in accounting from Tulane. And prior to uh, Tulane Law School, I worked for Ernst & Young's Global uh, Hedge Fund and uh, Tax Compliance Division in New York City. And I chose my topic comment tonight because of my background in accounting as well as my academic interest in corporate law and tax. I want to speak briefly with you today about the booming industry of U.S. liquefied natural gas and the vast opportunities the commodity presents for the maritime industry and in particular the U.S. maritime industry. I will discuss these opportunities through U.S. federal income tax perspective and provide critiques and suggestions for tax reform that could benefit the U.S. maritime industry. It is no surprise that the U.S. is experiencing an upswing in natural gas output through new technologies in hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling in the, Mar in the Marcellus, Bakken, and Eagleford shale formations. Even though oil prices have declined significantly in recent months, putting downward pressure on natural gas extraction efforts, America's natural gas excess supply is the key to energy independence from OPEC and offers thousands of jobs in exploration, production, and hopefully in LNG transportation. As energy-hungry countries in Japan and China continue to grow economically, it is imperative that the U.S. policymakers recognize this opportunity and provide tax reforms to encourage U.S. LNG exportation by U.S.-owned, U.S.-flagged vessels. Fortunately, it is looking like U.S. lawmakers are moving in the right direction. In early 2013, the U.S. Department of Energy approved Chenery Energy Sabine, pa Sabine Pass liquefaction facility, and more recently, the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approved Dominion Resources Cove Point Terminal in Maryland to ship LNG around the world. And this was the first uh, uh, LNG export project to be approved outside of the Gulf of Mexico. This is great news for the U.S. LNG industry and U.S. consumers. However, we must ensure that, ma that the majority of economic benefit accrues to the U.S. men and women of the maritime industry. As may already be evident, the U.S. private vessel industry has greatly decreased in power and size since the end of World War II. The U.S. Department of Transportation Maritime Administration reports that since 1951, the U.S. ocean-going merchant marine, marine fleet for oil and gas has declined by 82%. Although parts of the oil and gas, oil and LNG marine transportation industry have shifted to articulated tug barge units, the overall capacity of U.S.-owned, U.S.-flagged vessels has greatly diminished over the past five decades. This downward trend in U.S. ocean-going tankers of 1,000 gross tons or more is attributable to lower production costs abroad, 
higher U.S. regulatory costs because of the Jones Act, and an inequitable U.S. federal income tax regime providing greater benefits to foreign-owned foreign flag vessels. The underlying concern is that the U.S. is missing out on profitable vessel design and construction projects, lucrative chartering contracts, as well as overall growth in the maritime industry in the United States. The core problems that have led to this wide discrepancy that I will discuss are the 1920 Jones Act along with the U.S. federal income tax system. I'll first discuss the Jones Act. The 1920 Jones Act was a political tool to protect U.S. maritime workers from international competition for the transportation of goods between U.S. ports. Unfortunately, among many of the Act's benefits, the adoption of the Jones Act has also hindered America's growth in the maritime industry through limiting innovation and significantly raising maritime regulatory costs. Not only has the U.S. lost significant vessel construction projects because of these higher costs, we've also lost potential chartering opportunities for U.S.-owned, U.S. flag vessels. Because of the Jones Act, the total average daily operating cost currently for a U.S.-owned, U.S. flag vessel is approximately $20,000, but only $7,500 for foreign-owned, foreign flag vessels. For example, as of now, it is cheaper to ship a gallon of oil from Houston to London on a foreign-owned, foreign flag vessel than it is to ship a gallon of oil from Houston to New York on a U.S.-owned, U.S. flag vessel. Unfortunately, while the Jones Act has provided protection from international competition, its increased regulatory burden is limiting America's ability to capitalize on LNG marine transportation by U.S.-owned, U.S. flag vessels. The second core concern that I would like to emphasize is the inequitable U.S. federal income tax regime between U.S.-owned and foreign-owned vessels. Without delving too far into the U.S. tax code, the basic rules of taxation for U.S.-owned, U.S. flag tankers is that when shipping a commodity between two U.S. ports, all income earned from this charter is treated as effectively connected income with the United States and will be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. Further, when a U.S.-owned, U.S. flag tanker transports a good from Houston to Japan, Section 863C2 of the Internal Revenue Code treats 50% chartering revenue as from sources within the U.S., and half of that charter's net income will be subject to U.S. tax at ordinary income tax rates. This same 50% sourcing rule under 863C also applies generally to foreign-owned foreign flag vessels. However, recently, to reduce the administrative burden of potential double taxation by both U.S. and the foreign-owned vessel's residence country or place of incorporation, in 2003, Congress adopted Code Section 883, which effectively precluded a foreign-owned foreign flag vessel from the 863 sourcing rules pending certain requirements are met. The primary requirement is that the U.S. will disregard the 863C sourcing rules for a foreign-owned foreign flag vessel if the vessel's resident country also does not pose tax on a U.S.-owned U.S. flag vessel. Basically, the message is both countries agree that we will not tax you if you do not tax us. The inherent irony here, though, is that most of the open registry countries where vessels generally incorporate, like Singapore, Panama, Liberia, and Hong Kong, already impose little, if any, tax on international vessel transportation income. Therefore, as you may be able to deduce, the current tax loophole that has been used by vessel owners is to incorporate in an open registry country, earn the 883 reciprocal exemption, and also avoid the costly regulatory requirements that are currently imposed under the Jones Act. Thus, the foreign flagged, foreign owned vessel is able to ship goods between U.S. ports and foreign ports, but for only approximately one third the cost of a U.S. owned vessel and an overall much less expens expensive annual tax liability. This unbalanced treatment in international shipping income should highlight the challenges faced to the resurgence of the U.S. maritime industry, considering the significant discrepancies in daily operating costs and potential income tax liabilities from shipping income. To be fair, the U.S. did adopt the elective tonnage tax regime in 2004 to combat the favorable treatment for foreign owned foreign flag vessels. However, the savings are minimal in comparison to what is offered under the 883 reciprocal exemption. The key concern with this imbalance is if it is financially more attractive for a vessel owner to incorporate in a foreign country and to avoid U.S. income tax, as well as higher regulatory costs, 
the U.S. loses valuable income from revenue, and in addition, we lose significant investment in maritime infrastructure projects exclusively in the U.S. While some may argue to simply scrap the Jones Act to facilitate greater investment in U.S. flagged vessels, I think there is a better and more realistic approach to encourage growth while preserving the national security protections provided under the Jones Act. Similar to a state sales tax exemption for items like food and medicine, the U.S. Treasury could adopt exceptions for LNG marine transportation income delivered by U.S.-owned U.S. flag vessels. Ideally, these carve-out provisions that would be specifically tailored to LNG transportation income would help decrease the cost of natural gas extraction, push the U.S. Department of Energy to grant additional export licenses, and spark a surge in U.S. vessel construction and U.S. chartering opportunities. In conclusion, the U.S. natural gas industry is currently experiencing an upsurge in production and a commensurate push from U.S. lawmakers to export the excess supply to energy-hungry countries around the world. This prospect for overseas transportation of LNG presents tremendous growth opportunities in the U.S. maritime industry. Further, while the LNG exportation review process and LNG regulations are currently in front of Congress and our administrative agencies, now is the time to deal with this long-standing tax problem. With sound tax reform policies like narrowing the tax base for LNG marine transportation income, lawmakers could catalyze lucrative charting opportunities for U.S.-owned U.S. flight vessels and help further strengthen the U.S. maritime industry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Fish, and I'm also a third year member of the Maritime Journal. And I wrote my comment about a statute, 18 U.S.C. 1115, which is commonly referred to as the Siemens Manslaughter Act. And I looked at the statute's potential application to offshore drilling disasters. And to do this, I looked at how courts had applied the statute historically, and also how the Eastern District of Louisiana, in a recent case called United States versus Calusa, interpreted and declined to apply the statute. So I picked this topic because I'm very interested in criminal law, and I also thought it was an interesting aspect of the Deepwater Horizon disaster that hadn't yet been thoroughly examined. So 18 U.S.C. 1115 provides, in relevant part, every captain, engineer, pilot, or other person employed on any steamboat or vessel by whose misconduct, negligence, or inattention to his duties on such vessel, the life of any person is destroyed, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. So not many people know about this statute, but the people who do know about it think that it's very controversial because it's a criminal liability statute without any mens rea requirement. So this statute was enacted in its original form in 1838. During the Industrial Revolution, steamboats emerged as a popular mode of travel, but along with this emergence came the frequent loss of human life due to explosions and collisions on steamboats. In fact, by 1838, more than 2,000 people had died on steamboats and hundreds more had been injured. And this rash of tragedy has motivated Congress to enact the original Siemens Manslaughter Statute. The text of the original statute is basically the same as the current statute, but at the time it only applied to vessels propelled in whole or in part by steam. But in 1871, Congress removed the phrase propelled in whole or in part by steam. And since then, the statute's been moved around and recodified in different sections, but the text of the statute has virtually remained the same. And now the statute's in the homicide chapter and has been given the title Misconduct or Neglect of Ship Officers. So to analyze the statute, I looked at three main prongs. First, who the statute applies to. Second, what type of vessels it applies to. And third, the standard of care required by the statute. So to do this, I did look at case law, and while there are a few more recent cases, almost all of the case law dealing with the statute comes from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So the first prong is the every captain, pilot, engineer, or other person employed requirement. The first known prosecution under the statute came in 1848 in a case called United States versus Warner. And in that case, both the first and second mate were charged under the statute because they were responsible for general supervision of the vessel. And in that case, the circuit court for the District of Ohio held that 
the words of the Siemens manslaughter statute are free of any ambiguity or uncertainty, so the courts must be governed by the plain language used by Congress. A few years later, in a case holding an engineer liable under the statute, the same court said that the statute applies to everyone who assumes to perform any responsible duties on board a vessel. In 1855, a captain's clerk was charged under the statute, and his only duties were to sell and to collect tickets on board a steamboat. In that case, the circuit court for the Southern District of New York held that the proper inquiry for deciding whether an individual is covered under the statute is only whether the individual was employed on the vessel at the time the lives were lost. So that brings us to the second requirement of the statute, which is the any steamboat or vessel requirement. And as I mentioned earlier, the vessels that have been covered by the statute have changed over time, and the statute no longer justifies the steamboats. And courts have long noted that Congress's intention in making this change was undoubtedly to expand the protection of human life on board vessels. But courts have refused to extend the statute to cover all vessels. In 1976, in a case called United States v. Lebrecht, the District of New Jersey held the statute does not extend to non-commercial pleasure vessels. And they reasoned that because the statute only applies to persons employed on vessels, it implies a commercial context within, within which the entire statute must be interpreted. So that brings us to the last prong, which is the negligence requirement. And case law interpreting this prong has been consistent since the statute's inception. All courts have found that the statute requires only slight negligence. No intent or malice is required. So basically, if the loss of life on a vessel is in any respect attributable to the defendant, then the defendant could be held liable under the statute. And we do have a fairly recent Fifth Circuit case interpreting this prong. Um, from 2005, a case called United States v. O'Keefe. And in that um, case, the Fifth Circuit held that negligence was sufficient to meet the culpability threshold under the statute because the plain language of the statute is clear on its face, and according to the plain language, the statute does not imply any sort of heightened negligence requirement. So that brings us to the most recent case interpreting the statute, which I mentioned earlier, is United States v. Calusa, a 2013 opinion from the Eastern District of Louisiana. And this was the first case to address the statute's potential applicability to a drill and rig blowout. In this case, two well site leaders were charged under the statute. And as well site leaders, they were the top BP employees on the Deepwater Horizon rig. And they were responsible for maintaining well control and ensuring that drilling operations were performed safely. Along with this responsibility came the duty to do the negative testing on the rig, which tests for pressure increases and fluid flows, which are both signs that the well might not be secure. If they observed these observations, they were trained to take measures to ensure control, such as shutting in the well, calling BP personnel on shore in Houston, or ceasing operations until well security was maintained. So on the evening of April 20th, 2010, both well site leaders supervised the negative testing on board the Deepwater Horizon rig. And they did observe several indications that the well was not secure, but they didn't call anyone on shore and they didn't stop operations. And as we all know, subsequently control of the well was lost, which resulted in an explosion that killed 11 men on board. In November of 2012, the government charged both well site leaders with 11 counts of Siemens manslaughter. The government alleged that the well site leader's negligent conduct approximately caused the death of the 11 men on board. The defendants in this case argued that the, the language of the statute did not apply to them, and ultimately the Eastern District of Louisiana agreed with them and granted the defendants motion to dismiss the 11 counts. It is important to note that the well site leaders in this case still have involuntary manslaughter charges pending against them, as well as Clean Water Act violations. Um, and in January of 2014, the court did refuse to dismiss those charges. So despite what other courts had held in the past, the Eastern District said that the Siemens Manslaughter Act is ambiguous, and so they needed to resort to statutory construction principles. The court found that since other persons employed is a general phrase that follows specific terms, it should only apply to persons of the same general kind or class as those that are specifically mentioned. Now the government contended that the common attribute among all the people listed was just responsibility for the safety and well-being of those on board the vessel. But the court ultimately concluded that other persons employed should only apply to persons dealing with the function and the navigation of the vessel, and the well site leaders did not fit this definition. The government also tried to argue that the statute should apply to these defendants 
because explosions on oil rigs pose similar safety con concerns as explosions on steamboats, which is why Congress enacted the statute in the first place. But the court said it's up to Congress to include these types of disasters within the statute's reach. So the court did not hold that the well site leaders weren't negligent, just that the language of the statute did not apply to them. So in light of the, this holding and some problems that I had with the reasoning, I analyzed whether the statute should be applied in the offshore oil and gas industry. Admittedly, it is a very old statute, and the Eastern District's interpretation of it suggests that it might be effectively obsolete, even though the plain language of the statute seems to fit the well site leaders. Even in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the resulting moratorium, over $16 billion is expected to be invested in additional drilling rigs in the Gulf by the end of 2015. And along with this increased profitability of the offshore drilling industry comes significant corollary costs. In fact, in a study conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2003 to 2010, they found that offshore oil and gas workers are seven times more likely to die at their jobs than the average American worker. And while many of these deaths are undoubtedly accidental, in some instances, negligent behavior of individuals may lead to the death of offshore workers that could have ultimately been avoided. Even though the Calusa opinion is only a district court opinion, the lack of modern case law interpreting this statute makes it highly likely that future courts will follow the Calusa court's reasoning. And if that's the case, negligent behavior of individuals that does lead to death of innocent offshore workers could go unpunished under the statute. So for those of you who may think that imposing liability under the statute is extreme, I think it's important to keep in mind that these well site leaders do still have 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter pending against them. And I think if criminal liability is going to be imposed on individuals instead of or in addition to companies, it might be better to charge them under the statute that is at least specific to their industry rather than these more general criminal statutes. Therefore, I think it's imperative that Congress either get rid of the statute if they don't want it to be used, or amend the statute to explicitly include disasters such as the Deepwater Horizon blowout. And they could do this by amending the other person's employee phrase explicitly to include those who are responsible for important decisions on board drilling vessels. So in conclusion, I think going forward, it's important for Congress to not only work to prevent future similar harm to the environment, but also to prevent future harm similar to the ones experienced by the men who died on April 20th, 2010. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is David Friedman. I'm a member of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal and in my third year at Tulane University Law School. I wrote my paper on admiralty jurisdiction in the context of aviation tort claims, uh, issues that arise when aircraft crash in navigable bodies of water. Um, I named my paper A Court for Icarus, which if you remember from Greek mythology is the story of a young man who flies too high and the sun melts his wings and he, he falls into the sea of Crete where he's never seen again. I um, thought that was poetically relevant, so anyway. Um, when aircraft crash into navigable bodies of water, a myriad of legal issues arise, but before any of them can be adjudicated, a court of admiralty must first ascertain whether it has jurisdiction. Um, in the context of aviation tort claims, any conversation of where these boundaries begin and end necessarily starts with executive jet, uh, executive jet aviation versus the city of Cleveland, which was a uh, landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court. Um, without going into too much detail of that decision, its importance reaches far past just aviation tort claims. It's important and a landmark decision for all of maritime tort jurisprudence. And, and what it held is that if a party is seeking to invoke a court's admiralty jurisdiction based on a maritime tort, that party must satisfy two elements, one locus and two nexus. Locus means that the tort occurred on navigable waters, and nexus means that the activity giving rise to that tort has a significant relationship to traditional maritime activity. Um, in the context of aviation torts, the maritime locus inquiry has been relatively straightforward. You pretty much know where the aircraft crashed, whether it crashed in navigable waters or crashed on land. Um, what's important in this analysis, though, is that where the tort originates is almost irre irrelevant to the inquiry. Um, 
in many of these cases, it's the land-based negligence of an air traffic controller or some personnel on the ground, and they allege because that caused the aircraft to crash, then state law should apply to these claims. But the courts have pretty much uniformly rejected these arguments. You can see that in the Ninth Circuit's decision of United States v. Miller, the Eleventh Circuit's decision of United States v. Williams, or the Fifth Circuit's decision of Smith v. Panerco. Uh, what is far more important in the maritime locus inquiry in these avi aviation tort claims is where that tort first impacts the plaintiff. Um, what the courts define as the substance and consummation of the loss. Um, in this respect, I say locus is a very, very straightforward inquiry. You know where that plane crashes. There are some very rare cases where, where the plane crashed is not as straightforward. A plane either hits a seawall on its way down or slides across land before settling in navigable waters. And if you come across a case like that, I would direct your attention to two recent decisions from the Southern District of New York. Uh, those, the Southern District of New York crafts its own test, which looks at the inevitability and the imminence of when that plane was going to go down. Um, but they're very rare cases, and generally locus is straightforward. What is far less straightforward is the maritime nexus inquiry in these aircraft crash cases. Again, what nexus means is that the activity giving rise to the tort has a significant relationship to, the, to, to traditional maritime activity. What this means in the context of aviation tort is that the aircraft was engaged in a function traditionally performed by waterborne vessels. It's this kind of amorphous legal, uh, amorphous legal function that courts of admiralty have really struggled in applying uniformly and consistently only in the past five or six years. Executive Jet, in the four decades after Executive Jet was decided, courts consistently held that this nexus requirement was satisfied when the aircraft was performing functions of transoceanic transport of personnel or, or cargo or ferrying personnel and equipment between offshore platforms or any time the aircraft was engaged in a, a transport function between masses of land completely separated by navigable waters. Um, that was pretty well established for almost four decades and then nine decisions that reached the circuit court of appeal level, the courts consistently sustained admiralty jurisdiction in those cases. It's only been in the last five or six years that uh, there's been a lack of clarity and a lack of uniformity and several decisions at the circuit court of appeal level that have come to inconsistent conclusions with this body of jurisprudence. Um, this presents an opportunity for practitioners to make clever arguments why admiralty should or should not apply. And, there are inherent procedural and substantive rules to admiralty or a state court that can be very beneficial to the interests of your clients. Um, just to name a few, there are very different statute of limitations that may apply. In Louisiana, generally you have one year to bring a tort claim. Under the general maritime law, you have three years. Uh, the recoverability of prejudgment interest is at stake and something simple as whether you want your claim to be heard before a jury. This non-exhaustive list just highlights how important the practitioner's choice in where he wants to bring suit. And because there's this lack of uniformity in these aircraft crash cases as of late, practitioners have this opportunity to make arguments whether admiralty should or should not apply. Again, what nexus means is that the, tort, the activity giving rise to the tort is a significant relationship to traditional maritime activity. Um, and in the 40 years after executive jet, the courts consistently found that nexus inquiry satisfied. But they did so only in wrongful death actions. Now the recent trend, and why I say the body of law is less than clear and less than uniform, the recent trend has been for parties to try to invoke a court's admiralty jurisdiction in context outside of wrongful death. And although the court doesn't make this the explicit part of their reasoning, courts have almost uniformly rejected these claims and said they, they don't belong in the court of admiralty. Uh, for example, there's the First, Cir the First Circuit decision of Islanana Aircraft Services, or the Tenth Circuit's recent decision of pilotless boats. In both these cases, a plane crash landed on navigable waters. It was involved in transoceanic transport, but the, the pilot manages a successful crash landing on those waters. The plane, though, is severely damaged. Uh, in turn, the owner then sues the manufacturer, alleging a defect in the design of the plane. And the manufacturer says, well, because this was transoceanic transport, Nexus is satisfied, and Admiralty should apply, and with it, substantive rules like the economics loss rule, which if you don't know what that is, the economics loss rule is a maritime principle that 
if a product with a defect only damages itself without damaging other equipment or other people, those losses are not recoverable. So it's in this context of recent aircraft crash cases outside of wrongful death the parties are trying to invoke a court's admiralty and having very limited success. And they're doing so in cases that are nearly factually identical. Um, there's this lack of uniformity. And for an example, to compare a recent decision out of the Fifth Circuit, um, Alamon v. Omni Energy Services, with a prior decision of the Fifth Circuit, <coughs> Smith v. Pan Airco. In both cases, you have a helicopter approaching an offshore platform. In both cases, you have the helicopter, uh, a, rotor, a rotary blade of the helicopter striking a fixture of that platform. In both cases, you have the helicopter ultimately ending up in the Gulf of Mexico. But in one, Alamon, the court says that admiralty is appropriate, and in the other one, it said, excuse me, Alamon says admiralty is inappropriate, while in the other one, the court uh, holds admiralty appropriate. It's this lack of uniformity that I, I thought was ripe for exploration and the reason I chose this topic. Um, Although it, it presents this opportunity to practitioners to get clever with their arguments why admiralty should or should not apply, uh, I argue in my paper that this lack of uniformity, we, we should treat cases like cases in similar ways. Um, it, we should encourage investment in the airline industry and we should be consistent with this substantial body of jurisprudence that has arisen in 40 years after executive jet. Um, I think the reason that courts have declined to apply admiralty jurisdiction in, in the recent cases, or in any case at the district court level where they decline admiralty, they do so on, under this reasoning that maritime law evolved over centuries to meet the needs of mariners and vessels plying the navigable waters of the world, and such rules have no bearing on the operation of aircraft. And while that may be true, looking at the aircraft transport industry as completely alien and different than admiralty, I think is it's a little bit of a stretch. I think the whole function of the airline industry is, and aircraft in general, is that it enables the transport of goods and people across vast distances and often over navigable waters. And if you're going to hold that such claims are cognizable in admiralty for 40 years, I don't think it should make a difference whether it's a wrongful death claim or, or some other claim in which you're trying to invoke maritime principles. That's my paper. If you have any questions, I'd love to address it after this, after Katie and Brian present, and thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Brian Kitts, and I'm a 3 L member of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. I wrote my comment about the unearned wages component of maintenance and cure. I wrote my comment about this topic because it involved a very recent development, the expansion of unearned wages to include non-base pay compensation to a very old remedy, maintenance and cure. I'll begin with a brief historical overview of maintenance, cure, and unearned wages. The Seaman's right to maintenance and cure is truly ancient. The medieval sea codes, that is the laws of Oleron, the laws of Wisby, the laws of Hans Towns, the marine ordinances of Louis XIV, all contained rough forms of maintenance and cure. In the United States, maintenance and cure was first articulated as a facet of our general maritime law in the 1820s in Hardin v. Gordon. Maintenance entitles an, entitles an ill or injured seafarer to the living expenses that he enjoyed during his service at the ship. Cure entitles the ill or injured seafarer to medical expenses. But maintenance and cure as a remedy is much broader than this. A seaman who becomes ill or injured during his service of the vessel is also entitled to unearned wages. And at least since the Osceola, unearned wages have been a fundamental component of the maintenance and cure remedy. An ill or injured seafarer is entitled to all three, that is maintenance, cure, and unearned wages, or none at all. A seaman's wages are principally established in two sources, the shipping articles and collective bargaining agreements. Shipping articles are simply a contract of employment between a ship owner and each member of the ship's crew. Collective bargaining agreements are negotiated between the seaman's employer and his union, and collective bargaining agreements have actually assumed the primary role in determining a seaman's uh, terms and conditions of employment. In many cases, the shipping articles now simply reproduce the provisions contained in the collective bargaining agreement. This leads to the question, what compensation can seamen recover as unearned wages? 
And until recently, the answer to that question seemed very simple. Seamen who become ill or injured during their service of the ship could recover the base pay stipulated in the shipping articles or in the collective bargaining agreement. Previously, when a seaman brought suit to recover unearned wages, courts routinely restricted unearned wage payments to this base pay. As late as 1985, the treatise The Law of Seamen plainly stated that unearned wages were equal to the base pay as stated in the shipping articles. However, Professor Force, who is now a modern author of the current edition of The Law of Seamen, will tell you that it doesn't say this anymore. And here's the reason why. Modern courts have begun expanding the unearned wages component of maintenance and cure to include various forms of non-base pay compensation. The Eleventh Circuit has expanded, non has expanded unearned wages to include expected tip income. The Ninth Circuit has, has expanded unearned wages to include paid leave. And the Second Circuit has expanded unearned wages to include expected overtime income. The Eleventh Circuit was the first court to expand the unearned wages component of maintenance and cure to include a form of non-base pay compensation. In Flores v. Carnival Cruise Lines, a cabin steward aboard a cruise ship fell ill and was discharged from the vessel. The Eleventh Circuit held that this cabin steward could recover his expected tip income as unearned wages. The steward's employment contract mentioned that he could earn a significant amount of tip income during his employment and on previous voyages aboard other cruise ships, he did so. However, the employment contract did not guarantee that the seaman would earn any tip income. The employment contract also did not guarantee that anticipated tip income should be included in any unearned wage payments. Nevertheless, the 11th Circuit adopted a but-for standard and it concluded that the cabin steward would have earned a significant amount of tip income but for his injury. Importantly, the 11th Circuit applied this but-for standard retrospectively. It looked to his previous tip income during prior voyages aboard cruise ships. It didn't look to his present employment contract. It couldn't have looked to his present employment contract because it didn't indicate or guarantee that the seaman would have earned any tip income. This but-for test is important. It's important because both the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit will adopt the Eleventh Circuit's reasoning and standard in subsequent jurisprudence. Several years after the Eleventh Circuit's decision in Flores, the Ninth Circuit extended the unearned wages component of maintenance and cure to a new form of non-base pay compensation, paid leave. In Lipscomb v. Foss Maritime, a seaman was injured while working aboard a tug. The Ninth Circuit held that this seaman could recover his paid leave as unearned wages. The Seaman's Collective Bargaining Agreement stipulated rates both for his base pay and his paid leave. The Seaman was to accrue paid leave whenever he was required to work. That is, whenever the Seaman showed up to work, he immediately began earning one, his base pay, and two, his paid leave. The Ninth Circuit here directly applied the but-for test that had been established by the Eleventh Circuit in Flores. It found that but-for the Seaman's injury, he would have earned paid leave during the 15.5 days that he was incapacitated. The court therefore concluded that paid leave was simply a deferred component of the Seaman's base wage and that he could therefore recover it as unearned wages. Most recently, the Second Circuit established a third form of non-base pay compensation that an ill or injured seafarer can recover as unearned wages, expected overtime. In Padilla v. Maersk Line Limited, a cook aboard a Maersk U.S. flagged ship suffered a stomach injury. The Second Circuit held that this cook could recover his expected overtime compensation as unearned wages. This cook's collective bargaining agreement established wage rates both for his base pay and for his overtime. However, the collective bargaining agreement did not guarantee that the cook would earn any overtime compensation. It also didn't guarantee or require that the cook work any overtime hours. Nevertheless, the Second Circuit adopted the but-for test from Flores and, like the Eleventh Circuit, applied it retrospectively. The Second Circuit noted that the, court, that the cook had earned significant overtime compensation on previous voyages aboard, aboard other Maersk vessels. It reasoned, therefore, that he would have done so again but for his stomach injury. Accordingly, the court concluded that 
the cook, injured, could recover expected over time as part of his unearned wages. This brings me to the fun part, what these courts got right and what they got wrong. The but-for test is an appropriate standard for determining an employer's unearned wage obligation. The purpose of maintenance and cure has long been to put an ill or injured seaman in the position that they would have been if not for their illness or injury. The but-for test, properly applied, plainly achieves this end. And with respect to paid leave, the Ninth Circuit got it right, something I don't often get to say. <laughs> The Siemens claim for paid leave in Lipscomb satisfies the but-for test because paid leave in this circumstance was simply a part of the base wage agreement. It was not optional. The Siemens showed up to work and immediately began earning both his paid leave and his base pay. There's nothing speculative about this. However, the 11th and 2nd circuits have misapplied the but-for test. First. Expected tip income and expected overtime income are far too speculative to satisfy the but-for test. In Juarez, the cabin steward was not guaranteed to earn any tip compensation. In Padilla, the cook was not guaranteed to earn any overtime compensation. He also wasn't required to work any overtime hours. The 11th and 2nd circuits have dis disregarded these essential facts. It's absolute speculation that either of these individuals would have earned these non-guaranteed forms of non-base pay compensation. Second, applying the but-for test retrospectively produces inconsistent results. Two seamen working aboard the same vessel in the same capacity and injured in the same manner can be entitled to different unearned wages simply because one had more opportunity to earn overtime or was awarded more tips on a previous voyage. This fact frustrates the ease with which the maintenance and cure remedy is to be applied, and it contravenes the essential uniformity to which Admiralty aspires. Finally, both cases rely heavily on Hardin v. Gordon's antiquated and paternalistic conception of seamen as the wards of Admiralty. This characterization bears little resemblance to modern maritime employment. Seamen are no longer poor and friendless as Justice Story described them in the 1820s. Instead, they're well represented by unions that negotiate the essential terms and conditions of their employment. If seamen want speculative forms of non-base pay compensation, such as non-guaranteed expected tip income or non-guaranteed expected overtime income added to their unearned wages, their unions can simply raise this issue during the collective bargaining process. So what does this mean for the ship owner employer? It means simply this. You are likely on the hook with respect to unearned wages for much more than you used to be. My criticism of the Second and Eleventh Circuits notwithstanding, um, the trend seems obvious. Courts are increasingly expanding unearned wages to include these forms of non-base pay compensation and ship owner employers' unearned wage obligations are likely to expand with it. Thank you. Good evening everyone, my name is Katie Wyarda and I am also a third year law student and member of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. So I wrote my comment about how publicly traded companies can prove compliance with the Jones Act citizenship requirements for eligibility to engage in the coastwise trade. I got the idea for this paper as a result of Professor Neil Kling who teaches the documentation and vessel finance class at Tulane. Um, given the complexities of this issue, I'll admit at first I was a little hesitant about this, but after doing a bit of research, I became very excited about this topic. Not only did it present me with the opportunity to learn something new, but I realized the practical significance of this issue as it relates both to an individual vessel's ability to engage in the coastwide trade and the overall sustainability of the coastwide trade in general. So I'm going to start with a brief overview of the issues in the current state of the law. Then I'm going to go into a short history of vessel documentation and the coastwide trade laws in general. Then I'll provide an example of the complexities of this issue by examining the Coast Guard's recent investigation into the citizenship status of Trico Marine Services, a publicly traded company that owns several vessels engaged in the coastwide trade. Then with that, I'm going to look at the Coast Guard's findings and recommendations and also the public comments they solicited as end of the result. Finally, I'm going to end with an analysis of my overview of the Coast Guard's policy. So 
So presently, the Coast Guard is the administration in charge of issuing certificates of documentation and deciding which vessels are eligible to engage in the coastwise trade. As the law currently stands, in order to engage in the U.S. coastwide trade, a vessel must, among other things, be wholly owned by a U.S. citizen. Section 46 of the Jones Act sets forth the requirements that must be satisfied in order for a person or entity to comply with the citizenship step as a citizen of the U.S. Although the Jones Act discusses a variety of persons and entities, the group that has had the most difficulty proving compliance with these requirements have been publicly traded companies. Essentially, one of the requirements for corporations to prove U.S. citizenship is that at least 75% of the shares of its stock must be owned by a U.S. citizen. However, given the current makeup of the market, establishing how to factually prove that this requirement has been met has become extremely difficult and a source of concern and debate for publicly traded companies, in part because the Coast Guard has maintained a long-standing position that the coastwide trade is a restrictive trade, access to which is a privilege. So practically speaking, if public companies are unable to prove U.S. citizenship, they will thus be forced out of the coastwide trade, and this policy could thus have the potential to seriously hinder the development of the coastwide trade, which is essential for our nation's economic and national security. So broadly speaking, vessel documentation is a national form of registration. In order to enter and leave ports, engage in national or international commerce, and enjoy the protection of a nation's laws, every vessel must be documented or registered under the laws of the state. Once a vessel is documented, it receives a certificate of documentation, and that certificate provides conclusive evidence of a vessel's nationality, as well as it affords it the rights, privileges, and immunities of that state. Once a vessel receives its stock certificate, it can then apply for an endorsement to its certificate, which evidences its ability to participate in a particular trade, such as the coastwise, fisheries, or recreational. However, a vessel can only operate within those trades that it, is, that it has an endorsement for. If a vessel is found operating outside of its endorsement, the vessel could be subject to a fine and or forfeiture or seizure by the U.S. government. The U.S. began documenting vessels in 1789, and in the years following, Congress enacted a series of laws outlining the basic requirements for vessel documentation. In short, these laws gave decided preference to U.S. vessels and essentially limited eligibility for U.S. Doc vessel documentation to only those vessels that were either U.S. owned and U.S. built, or if foreign built, wholly owned by U.S. citizens. Today the law is essentially the same and states that in order for a vessel to be eligible for documentation in the U.S., it must be one, wholly owned by a U.S. citizen, two, have a net volume of five tons, and three, not be registered under the laws of another state. In general, the statute broadly defines a U.S. citizen as either an individual who is a citizen of the U.S., an association, trust, joint venture, or other entity, a partnership, corporation, the U.S. government, or the government of a state. However, proof of citizenship for each of these entities depends both on the type of entity and the particular trade for which they are applying. For example, the requirements of a vessel engaging in the coastwide trade will be different than a corporation engaging in the fisheries trade. But as mentioned, here we are concerned only with the requirements of the coastwide trade. So coastwise trade is essentially trade between two ports in the U.S. From its early days as a nation, the U.S. recognized the need to create an, have a domestic maritime industry and an adequate merchant marine. So beginning in 1789, the U.S. enacted a series of, law, of laws aimed directly at doing that. Today, the coastwide trade is primarily governed by the Jones Act. Section 55102 provides that a vessel may not participate in the coastwide trade unless it is wholly owned by a U.S. citizen and has a certificate of documentation. Under the Jones Act, in general, a corporation is a U.S. citizen if it is 1. incorporated under the laws of the U.S., 2. its CEO, chairman, and board of directors are all U.S. citizens, and 3. no more of its directors can be non-citizens than a minority that is necessary to constitute a quorum. Fourth, in addition, if engaging in the coastwide trade, then at least 75% of the interest must be owned by citizens of the U.S. So to determine the 75% interest requirement, the Jones Act provides that title to at least 75% of the stock in the corporation must be vested in U.S. citizens. Two, at least 75% of the voting power in the corporation must also be vested in U.S. citizens. Three, there can be no contract by which more than 25% of the voting power in the corporation can be exercised directly or indirectly on behalf of a person that is not a U.S. citizen. And last, there can be no other means by which control of more than 25% of any interest in the corporation is given or permitted to be exercised by a non-citizen. 
So finally, if there is a corporate chain, meaning the corporation is comprised of various entities, then each, the law requires that each of those entities also comply with all of these requirements, including the 75% share of ownership. While the first three requirements have proven fairly straightforward, it is the fourth, the 75% U.S. ownership of stocks, that has proven extremely difficult for publicly traded companies to establish and prove compliance. Clearly, the statutory tests are complex. However, the bigger difficulty has been the, pro the Coast Guard has refused to divert from its long-standing position that this is a restrictive trade, and they've continued to strictly regulate admission into the Coast Guard trade. In processing applications, the Coast Guard relies on a, ser a service of self-certification, meaning that once a vessel files and completes a certificate of documentation, that creates a rebuttable presumption that the applicant is a U.S. citizen. If evidence is provided that the ship has an, is actually not a U.S. citizen, then the Coast Guard can launch into an investigation. Unfortunately, given the way public corporations are formed and the way the stock market operates, it is almost impossible for a publicly traded company to actually obtain information about its shareholders at any given time. For one, the stock market is dominated by shareholder privacy concerns. For example, the SEC has enacted these laws that prohibit disclosure of a shareholder's information to anyone but its broker or dealer. Second, the stock market is constantly trading and stocks are constantly changing hands. So that's making it extremely difficult for a company to actually know who's holding its shares of stock at any particular moment. So that's the question is, given these realities, how can publicly traded companies sufficiently comply with the Jones Act 75% proof of U.S. citizenship requirement and be able to participate in the coastwide trade? A great example of the complexity of this issue was the Coast Guard's recent investigation into the citizenship status of Trico Marine Services. As mentioned, they owned about 13 vessels that were engaging in the coastwide trade. The Coast Guard then received what it considered credible allegations that perhaps Trico wasn't sufficiently complying with the citizenship requirements. So the Coast Guard launched an investigation and they ended up concluding that Trico failed to approve compliance with the Jones Act citizenship requirements. And they ended up fining them almost $6 million and suggesting that their certificates of documentation be revoked. So in its defense, Trigo argued that it had sufficiently complied, and it gave several arguments. For one, they argued that the shares of owners were, that were allegedly foreign owned were actually beneficially owned by U.S. citizens, and that beneficial ownership, not legal ownership, should be the determining criteria for citizenship. Two, they argued they had done all that they could to verify the U.S. citizenship status of its shareholders, but that, as mentioned, given the complexities of the laws surrounding this, public companies were severely limited in obtaining actual knowledge of their shareholders. Third, they argued that they had relied on the DTC, which is the nation's central security depository, SEG 100 program. This is an inference-based program that basically provides a number of the percent that they consider what to be the public company's citizenship. So Trico got declarations from that program and that said that less than 25% of its shares were foreign owned. Finally, Trico did a little last-ditch effort that was basically like, if we can't prove compliance, then no publicly traded company can prove compliance. The Coast Guard unfortunately had little empathy for and dismissed each of these claims on the ground that, again, Jones Act is a restrictive trade, access to which is a privilege. So broadly speaking, the Coast Guard's biggest problem with the proof provided by Trico was that it relied on these inference-based programs and failed to provide actual direct citizenship, proof of its U.S. of citizenship. And according to the Coast Guard, that was not sufficient to qualify to engage in one of the most restrictive trades in the country. While the Coast Guard did not outright reject these programs, they just said that alone these measures were not enough and they needed, Trico needed to do more. Despite its preclusion against Trico, the Coast Guard did provide some recommendations as to how it thought publicly traded companies could prove ownership. These mechanisms included restricting the sale of, of stock to U.S. citizens, administering a dual stock certificate program for citizens and non-citizens, using a non-objecting beneficial ownership list that they could get from the SEC to determine citizenship, or placing restrictions in the Articles of Incorporations and bylaws that restricted this, the transfer of stocks to foreign citizens, or finally, any, placing restrictions in the Articles and bylaws that to establish ownership of sufficient equity or stock interest is restricted to U.S. citizens only. In addition, following its investigation, the Coast Guard also issued a public notice soliciting advice from local practitioners and trade associations on their thoughts and possible mechanisms of compliance. In general, the comments were voiced the same concerns as I've kind of touched on. They thought that the Coast Guard should rely more heavily on these infant space programs, 
They also were worried about the potential depletion of the coastwise trade and in effect the nation's economic and national security if the Coast Guard continued to adhere to these strict requirements. And they also were worried about the high cost corporations are going to have to undertake to try and comply. As alternatives to this direct reproof, the comments basically suggested that maybe they adopt the MARAD's 90% fair inference rule. So what this program does is rather than rely on direct proof, under this rule, if a corporation has more than 30 shareholders, then evidence that at least 90%, 95% of the corporation's stock is held by those persons with addresses in the U.S., then that creates an inference that at least 75% of the stock is owned by U.S. citizens. They also, this is much more manageable than the current state of things. They also suggested to give more weight to the SEG 100 program, possibly monitor SEC filings, or include other protective provisions in the corporation's documents. However, despite these acknowledgments, the Coast Guard still has not taken further affirmative action and adopted any of these measures. In conclusion, they basically said, what we're, we will take into account is the good faith effort in, of the company and their effort to prove citizenship status. So in my opinion, what is most concerning is not the Coast Guard's finding as to Trico's citizenship status, but their, what they considered sufficient evidence of U.S. citizenship. First off, given the structure of today's market, it really is impossible to actually know at any time the citizenship status of any of individual shareholders. And in addition to that, such an investigation would not only be time consuming, it would be extremely cost worthy. Second, although the Coast Guard gave recommendations, the problem is they didn't offer any guidance beyond what Trico had put in place as their measures for determining citizenship status. The Coast Guard demanded Trico do more, but they really didn't provide guidance as to how they could do that. Third, though good in theory, few of the Coast Guard's recommendations are actually viable opinion options for public companies. For example, the Coast Guard recommended restricting shares of stock. However, given the fact that the purpose of the stock market is to facilitate trade, it's likely, unlikely that they will avoid a transfer just because some companies' bylaws suggest that they can't actually have this transfer of stock. In addition, there would be no practical way to determine when the sale of stock exceeded 25% maximum because the shares of stock would be under either a street name or the disclosure of the name could be prohibited. The dual stock certificate would face similar issues. So thus, in light of the heavy burden on public companies and the importance of the coastwide trade to the U.S., both in terms of economic and national security, more affirmative action by the coastwide needs to be done. Continuing to require absolute and direct proof of citizen is just currently not feasible in light of the market. In addition, simply telling companies that they will take into account the good faith efforts of that company to comply really doesn't provide them with guidance. And if the purpose of the coastwide trade is to protect the nation's economy and national security, then imposing high proof requirements that could potentially eliminate a number of vessels in operating in the coastwide trade is not a good solution. Not only will the vessels be deterred because of the risks of exclusion, but potential investors are likely not to invest in these kind of companies. So perhaps a better solution, and at least until a more permanent one can be created, is to rely on some of these inference-based programs. While this isn't the best method, it could at least give approximate number of the, <coughs> of the percent of the citizenship of the corporation shareholders until more reliable mechanisms can be created. Either way, it is clear that more needs to be done. Thank you. I want to congratulate on behalf of the ABA uh, all of the students whose articles were uh, selected for publication. I know that that's stiff competition over at the Tulane Maritime Law Journal, uh, and so great work, guys. Uh, also, thank you very much for your hard work in coming to present today. Everybody did an outstanding job, and you should be very proud of yourselves. How about another round of applause for everyone? You'll take uh, some more time out of your busy schedule. We'd be happy to uh, enjoy a drink with you. Thanks. <laughs> 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 so <laughs>